hello to everyone who's watching us. Um, uh, obviously, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a button called Q&A. Feel free to click that button and ask us any questions you might want to. Uh, I'm Duncan Bruce, the alumni manager at the NFTS. I'm also a grad editing graduate. And obviously, we are here with Endemiri and Daniel. Um, and we're just waiting for Chloe. Hopefully, she's going to join us in a second. Uh, when did you graduate, Dan? 2007. So I, I started the NFTS in 2008. So I guess we just missed each other. Yeah. Yeah. And Endemiri, I know when Endemiri graduated. Yeah, very recently. <laughs> He's a star in a very short amount of time. <laughs> yeah, it's two, what, two, two years ago now. Because it's been two years. It yeah. flies. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, all right. You've edited two feature films. <laughs> Don't rub it in. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, well, should we get started and then Chloe can join us when she uh, logs in, hopefully. Um, so my first question, and I'll start with Endemiri. Uh, what was your background before coming to the NFTS? So what was your journey to the NFTS? Why did you get interested in editing, mm -hmm. basically? Um, I think I kind of always had this interest in stories and storytelling. Um, from growing up, my like family had a lot of books in the house and I just read a lot. I was also homeschooled, so I spent a lot of time just reading. Um, and actually, I think the first thing I wanted to do was be an author and to write novels. Um, and then I think, I don't know, when I was like 12, 13, I discovered uh, that you could make films and moving picture and that would, that you could combine like storytelling with pictures and um, started getting really excited about that and uh, started sort of bullying my family into like making projects together. Hello. Hey, Chloe. Hi. Hi. So we're, we're do, we've just started off with questions about how we got interested in editing and arrived at the NFTS. So uh, um, uh, is that you? Are you done, Endemiri? I, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to end it <laughs> Uh, and then basically I, I did this thing called the BFI Film Academy, which was a course set up um, by the BFI for 16 to 19 year olds. Um, and uh, as part of the course, you basically go down to NFTS for two weeks. I think it's the first year they run it. And you go down to NFTS for two weeks and get put in groups and you get to work, work on films together. Um, and, I, uh, and you get put in different disciplines. So I applied to be an editor in terms of editing um that the short film we made there and i met loads of like really cool people um and actually not just the students but also some of the staff i think shola um amu a director i work with a lot he was i think he just graduated so he was kind of one of the mentors mm. one of the staff stopped helping out um yeah and i sort of i guess it went on from there and i went to university did a sort of bachelor's in editing and kind of always had an interest in the back of my head as a place i really wanted to go back to um, but knew I was like way too young to, to get in and after university um, I thought okay I'm still too young but I'll, <laughs> I'll apply now just so they know who I am um, and was like really lucky to actually to manage to get in and so that's that's when I started back in 2016 I think. So you know when you're at the BFI Film Academy and you picked editing mm -hmm. was that did you know you wanted to do that or was that just you making that decision then? So I, I knew, I think, because I was at college at the time and it was a kind of a general like, media course where you're doing everything, but I kept being drawn to the editing side of it and I was doing a lot of that um, kind of, because I was also, I'd spent a lot of time like teaching myself how to edit online and stuff, so I was kind of one of the most experienced students. So I kind of wasn't just doing my own stuff, I was also helping out other people and I kept I was basically the go-to guy um for the college as well for any kind of like promo material they wanted to make i was like the person who put it all together and so i knew that that was a bit i was really i really loved doing and the, the bit the part of like storytelling that i really enjoyed um yeah so when i when i applied for the the film academy thing i knew i that the editing bit was definitely the bit i wanted to do cool and how about you how did you make your journey to the nfts um well i started making films when i was about 11. I think my nana got a camcorder 
for the family to use and I basically stole it and just kept it and just made loads of crappy films of my sister and my cousin and um, it was the bit editing was the bit that I just really loved doing so I kind of did everything I, I wrote films I shot them um, I got all my friends in as actors my dad did the music um, they were I mean they're pretty terrible but um, you know and back then editing was basically you had the camera which was I think it was a eight mil high eight mil video camera and you'd have to plug it into the VCR and um, press play and then pause on the tape and it was like proper linear editing but you had to allow for the, there's a lag between when the the heads engaged on the on the tape for it to start recording so you had to time it perfectly um, and then you sort of dub on all the sort of um, music afterwards and it was really fun I just loved that and um, so I knew quite young that I wanted to make films and I kind of I guess I used to think I wanted to be a director but I wanted to be a filmmaker I didn't really know exactly what all the different roles were at first and then the more I did it the more I realized that editing was the bit that I loved and the stress of being on a film set trying to corral people and the responsibility if you don't get it on the day then you know that pressure whereas with editing you're just kind of making the best of what you can and quite like yeah. <laughs> that just suited me and I think also I was I don't know something, something mathematical about editing I always liked as well I was quite into sort of arts and maths and it just kind of for me it just felt right um, and then I went to uni and I did um, film and French because this was back in 1999 you couldn't do film studies really as a degree so I had to do it as a joint honours and also it wasn't filmmaking it was practical it was um, not practical it was film history film criticism which was brilliant because I learned all about great films and film history and what makes great films great and that is what informs me still now in everything I do like you know you're always looking back at all these amazing films and that taught me a lot um, and then I just, I don't know, I kind of, I kept on making little shorts and I ended up working as a runner because that's kind of what you do when you want to try and start out. But I was basically a waiter carrying trays of food and drink to editors. Um, and that was pretty, that wasn't great, but um, I just stuck with it. And then I managed to get a lucky break. I got some work experience on a film um, on Batman Begins, which in the cutting room, which was amazing. Um, and I was working with 35 mil film. Um, and then I applied for the FTS. I think someone, I think the production manager there suggested it to me. Um, and I didn't get in at first, but then someone dropped out. So I did. Um, but I, it was quite depressing because I, that job finished. And then I went back to being a waiter, a glorified waiter. And I didn't get in. And then, but then suddenly it all kind of changed. And then my life changed basically and um, put me on this road. So. I've got to ask a question because you said 35 mil. Were the editing using 35 mil? Or, uh... No. So um, basically, Christopher Nolan likes to watch his rushes in 35 mil. So we'd sync up with Mag from the day before. Okay. And um, then he'd screen it and then it gets sent back to be scanned okay. and come, back, come into the avid a day later. Now, suddenly I was imagining this glorious steam back and like all the 35 mil happily trundling through, but no. No, but that's what our room was like. Yeah. It was steam back and, you know, um, I can't remember what it was, synchronizers. Mm. You know, so you were like syncing up every take with the clap and sticking it all together. It was brilliant. Cool. All right, Chloe, uh, what, what was your background? How did you make your journey to the NFTS? I can't actually believe I ever ended up there, to be honest. I'd never cut anything before I went to wow. film school, before I kind of like applied. Um, and I, I'd done like loads of things before. I'd had like loads of kind of like careers, always kind of around film in some way, but I was not an editor. And um, I've been programming documentaries. I've been working for this organisation, Doc House, for about five years. And um, I just watched films all the time, like feature docs. And I remember... We, um, we did this festival, which was like about the crossover between documentary and fiction um, that, we'd, that I was like helping organize and run. And um, Justine Wright, who's Kevin McDonald's editor, um, came and gave a talk and I was around at her house one day. 
um, just like collecting some tapes and um, of like various kind of like early versions of some of the, um, I think it was scenes from The Last King of Scotland. And um, I said, to her, so, you know what, if I think I'll do what you do, and she said, why don't you just do it then? I was like, you know what, why don't I? <laughs> and then I, about, it took me about two years after that to apply to the film school. But I, because I had no background in it whatsoever, um, I, the film school felt like the best, clearest way for me to go. Um, it, because I, you know, I, I didn't, I just didn't know anything. I didn't know how you got into this world. Um, and I applied and I don't know how, but I got in. Well, the rest is history very much. I mean, you've done very well since. Um, okay, so all three of you have got to the film school. Uh, I know from experience, and as you guys do, you get to try so many different things from fiction to documentary to animation. Did you have something specific that you enjoyed at the NFTS that you felt you gravitated towards? Just curious. So let's go the other way around. So let's start with Chloe. Well, I'd been working in documentary, so I was watching documentaries, I'd met documentary directors, and I think it was the idea of cutting documentary that made me want to go into editing in the first place. So, um, yeah, I did. I mean, I always, that was always like my idea, but I really loved cutting fiction. I really loved working with the animators as well. Um, and so I don't know, it kind of like, it, it opened me up a little bit, but yeah, I, I knew very clearly that that's, that was the thing that I'd gone there to try and do, which I think was quite different from most people. Hmm. I think for most people, it seemed to be kind of fiction in my year, whereas I was a bit of the odd one out. Okay. Well, interestingly, I, mean, I started and wanted to do fiction and ended up wanting to be documentary. I, I had a reversal while I was at film school, but uh, Dan, how about you? I think I was quite open-minded. I think um, it's very different documentary and fiction editing, but they're both fascinating. And um, I ended up doing a lot more documentary earlier on in my career. Um, and then I've moved into fiction recently. And it's just, I mean, I guess you kind of want to do films, really. Yeah, I mean, you just want to, that's what the dream would be. So I guess I did gravitate towards fiction eventually, yeah. And and Demiri. Um, I'm trying to remember now. I think I think when I started, I I had a little bit of experience in fiction and documentary, but not in animation at all. Um, and so, but then I, I guess I kind of felt that, or I'd been told that it, you kind of have to pick. Um, and so I was I, when I started, I was like, okay, at some point in this two years, I'm going to have to decide what it, what it is that I'm interested in or most interested in. Um, but then like, doing animation and just working on all these different kind of projects with different people, I think it kind of it's opened me up even more. And actually I kind of fought it to the point where at the end I was like, no, I'm definitely going to try and do as much uh, to cross over as much as possible. Because um, actually I think I, what I'm in most interested in is stuff that kind of sits on the border between like, say, like fiction documentary or uh, my animation, my grad animation was like a kind of animation, but also live action. And I think I just like stuff that kind of crosses over and doesn't fit into a uh, specific category and so yeah I guess. Okay. You are told that you have to pick in a way um, when you go out there mm. because which is you know it's a bit depressing because you can get so you can learn so much from doing there's there's definite crossover between it all and it informs I mean I think it's really good just to, to think about how you cut a how you make a story out of documentary rushes is a really great you know that's completely different it's different storytelling, but it's, it's all really great experience and you are kind of expected. I mean, I think producers don't have much imagination and they don't have to take risks. So they want someone that's cut exactly what they want an editor for. So if you haven't done the same show 10 times before, then it's a bit of a risk. And I think it's ridiculous because a good editor is a good editor and can cut anything. But that is kind of how it is, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think I think what I've learned from storytelling and documentary, I've applied so much to fiction. I think that that understanding of the kind of building blocks of how to tell a story is like so vital. Yeah, and let's remember Thelma Shoemaker started off in documentary, and she's been rather successful. Uh, uh, so I've had there's been one question which I thought we should answer early on because it's related to something. So someone has asked uh, Dan specifically, can you describe what you meant when you said syncing with Mag? 
Okay. So um, obviously 35 millimeter film is just like a big roll of a film. And then to sync up the sound, um, they would transfer the sound to magnetic tape, which is the same size, 35 mil in a big roll. So basically you can sync them up, line them up together. And then when you run them at the same time, the sound and the picture plays at the same time. So you feed, it's basically the audio equivalent of film. So you feed them both into your steam bag, line them up and then you hit play and they both run through at the same time and the sound plays with the picture in sync, hopefully. But it doesn't always work that way. I mean, no. <laughs> uh, for those of you who might be interested in the course, it is something you do on the course. Um, which... Trim bin, do you still do trim bin exercise? Yes. Yeah, that was brilliant. I, I think, what is it we did on Steam Bet? Was it French Lieutenant's Woman? I'm trying to remember what. I think so. Is it Damages? Damage, Damage. Damage. The damage. So we have basically to explain to the audience, we, we get rushes from a, a film called Damage and we get to do them on Steam Bet. And as an editor, it's really rewarding. It was rewarding for me because in digital realms, you just randomly can cut and just press edit undo. You can't do that in Steambeck. You have to really think before you cut the film and try and splice it together. So if you get a bit too excited, you've got about 4 million little bits of film that you're trying to sellotape back together again to reconstruct yeah. it. So, um, you can't find a frame of it somewhere. I know, there's many happy memories and late nights. Um, uh, right, anyway, we shall move on. Oh, there's been a question that we're not sure. Uh, oh, uh, Harry's asked, could you name a few filmmakers and especially editors you revere? Um, I'll start with M. Demiri. Throw you on the hot spot. Oh, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> um, I really like, edit, specific about editing, I really like, uh, Two Joes. I like Joe, Joe Binney, I think, is a really incredible editor. Um, and the way he just thinks about things and handles different, different kinds of films. You, like, I feel like what I've learned so much is... Uh, the editor's the job is to like, find, find the tone of the film and the feel of the film. Uh, and and you know, you're not supposed to have like, a certain style or way, like, a way of approaching um, thing that you apply to everything. Uh, so I think like what Joe does really well is that he he each of his films feel really distinct and unique, um, and I think that's that's just really uh, I just admire that a lot. And then the other day, Joe Walker, I think is like an also a really impressive editor, and I think I just really admire um, the work that he does. Um, filmmakers in general, um, do, 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 do. I kind of got obsessed. I think actually whilst at film school with Alma Harrell um uh who is a well had, at that point was a documentary editor done done um a few documentaries and has recently made a fiction film but i think just the way kind of gets a whole ethos into into filmmaking and the way she kind of uh deals with her subjects and her contributors and then kind of really sort of personal authentic way i just really admired and there's something about the style of her filmmaking that, as I spoke about earlier, like crosses over between fiction and documentary. And I think it just really, um, yeah, it just really drew me in. Did she direct Honey Boy? She did, yes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great film. You should watch that, everyone. Um, Dan? <laughs> just trying to Google some. Quickly on IMDb looking up. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a tricky one, editors, because I think a really great editor kind of doesn't have a, you know, you kind of, you cut the, the, the film that you make the best film that there is and it's not always a style that you can see as an editor and go oh, that, I mean, you can see when a film's badly edited very quickly, um, the things that make sense and all the pacing's all wrong and or it feels very pedestrian, but then also, you know, it's to do with how it's directed, how it's shot. It's a, it's a tricky one. I mean, um, obviously Walter Murch is really, an amazing editor. Anyone out there who hasn't heard of him should look into him and check out some of his books. Um, although I'm not a fan of Final Cut Pro, which is the program that he um, kind of pushed forward um, in the industry for a bit. Um, 
And I love David Lynch films particularly. I mean, Mulholland Drive is one of my favourite films of all time. I did my dissertation about that. Um, and yeah, I mean, the classics, I guess, people like Hitchcock. I mean, Hitchcock, apparently, he was an editor as well. And he only shot the shots that he needed for each scene. He didn't do coverage because he knew how it was going to go together before he shot it. So that's really interesting, I think. Chloe? Whenever someone asks that question, my mind goes completely, like completely. Um, but I mean, like, I mean, like you say, it's it's really kind of difficult to to, to kind of pin down like specific editors because it is it's sort of you you're looking at everything that's there on the screen, not just the editing. And like you say, it's sort of it's very easy to kind of see something that you think is badly edited, but something that's well edited, it's like I don't know. I sometimes think some of like the best, my best editing is on some pretty mediocre films, um, just because you're you're trying so hard to kind of really kind of you know accentuate the the, the positives um, and and bring out the story that you know that no one that watches it would ever have any idea. Um, but I love, I mean, one filmmaker who I really love so much is Pavel Pawlikowski, who again started in this kind of like documentary and then the, that weird kind of crossover world as well, um, and then has moved into to fiction. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I just adore kind of everything that he does, like the, the humour as well as the darkness and, you know, and, and inhabiting that, that weird kind of crossover world where you're not quite sure if it's real or if it's it's um fictional um but yeah editors i find it really difficult i mean the, the editors that you guys are talking about are great i mean i saw i can't believe i haven't seen it before but about film american animals quite recently which kind of blew my mind um the editing on that i thought was phenomenal um, and then I think there was like three editors and my mind's gone completely blank as to who they were. So you'll have to Google it. I don't know the film, so I'm going to have to watch it. Sorry, I shall watch it though. <laughs> and I mentioned Thelma Shoemaker earlier. I mean, she's amazing because, I mean, she's old. She's a fairly old lady and the speed and the pace and the energy in her cut, cutting is amazing. And I think I love all Scorsese's films, I mean, the editing really makes them that, you know, frenetic pace and energy that, that comes in her, mm. where she cuts is, is brilliant, I think. It's very, it's very, she's very, she's a very lovely lady as well. She's very open. Um, although she could have edited The Irishman a bit more for me. But anyway, I shall... I haven't seen that. I shall move on. Uh, <laughs> that so, might, wasn't her decision, though. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to move on to a new, another question, which is: so after the NFTs, how did you find getting your first job and trying to establish yourself? And how long did you find it took yourself before you were kind of feeling that you were comfortable in your world as an editor? Uh, if I start with Chloe this time, if that's all right. Of course. Um... I so I was really quite lucky when I left. Um, I got fairly quickly, sort of, I'd say within six months to a year, I was offered a place on um, a kind of training scheme um, on 24 hours in AE, um, where they um, were kind of like, um, it was the very first year that they did it, and they had, um, uh, they got three editors that were kind of junior editor level as they saw it. And then they got like three people who were kind of assistant editor level. And we worked with really experienced editors um, to kind of cut episodes of that series, which is like a kind of giant juggernaut of a series. Um, but I think, I think I was really lucky to get on that because it gave me not only the kind of support in my first job um, post film school, but also, um, then you end up with television credits and I know there's all sorts of different ways to get into all sorts of different things but having a credit behind you helps you get the next job in a way that I think it, it can be difficult just coming out of film school and I know that some other people found it a little bit difficult just to get that kind of like foothold um, but there was a second part to that question which is how long did it take to feel kind of I think Chloe you might be frozen. 
Um, okay, let's move on to Dan then <laughs> while we wait for Chloe to refresh. Um, in terms of how long it took, I'd say it took years and years. Um, uh, it was, it's really hard, I think. Um, and you've just got to be really dedicated and really want to do it and just keep trying. Um, and I did kind of a lot of freelance stuff for sort of animated commercials. Um, I did short films. I did a, I assembled a feature for free. Um, I did some terrible, oh, you're back. <laughs> I was completely lost. I don't know how much you heard. You carry on. <laughs> Okay, um, I did. I was just about to say how I did some amazing. I did some um, how to street dance DVDs and how to play piano and all sorts of absolute <laughs> rubbish just to have some money to pay my rent. And I did, I, I got a TV drama um, a couple of years after film school, which was amazing. It's called Cast Offs, and it was brilliant. It was written by Jack Thorne, it's one of his possibly his first TV drama. Um, and I thought, well, that's it. Now I'm on my way. And um, I still couldn't get an agent. And it took years and years and years. Um, so it was a long road. But, you know, I enjoyed it and kept going. And yeah, got there in the end, I think. <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> we uh, answer, you never know. Uh, uh, Chloe, we'll, we'll pop back to you. We lost you, I think, at the bit where you said there was a second part to the question, which is how long it took. And then we didn't hear anything else. <laughs> oh, okay, good. It was a brilliant answer. It was the best <laughs> answer you've ever heard in your life. I don't know if I can recreate it as well. Um, I think it's. I. I think it took a long time. I think it's really kind of. Like I just got the end of what you were saying, but it's like, it. Like even now, I don't know if I'm completely comfortable. I mean, it's. I don't. It's, it's like people kind of seem to be coming to me now, which is fantastic. But I think for a long time, you're, you're kind of trying to navigate your world, like your way through this world. And you're trying to work out what it is exactly that you want to do and, and how to be able to do the projects that you're really passionate about, as well as the things that you, you feel are kind of like, you know, good for, for building your career, I suppose. Uh, um, so I, I, I guess I, I guess I feel kind of comfortable now, but I mean, I graduated like eight years ago, I think. So in a way, I suppose maybe that's quite quick if I feel kind of comfortable. Okay, uh, and Demiri, how about how about you? Um, I mean, I guess I feel like I'm still in the process of finding my way and I'm you're definitely not here at a point where I feel comfortable yet. Um, I think I was very lucky just after graduating. Um, I had, I think like immediately, basically I think at the graduation ceremony, the unfortunately late Nick Powell, um, he had just uh, left the school as like, the, head, the head of uh, head of NFTS and he um, turned around to me and was like, hey, you, do you have a job coming up? Do you have a job lined up? Um, and I got the opportunity to work on a film that he was producing, which was amazing. I did the first like director's assembly, but the first assembly in the director's cut uh, of that. Um, that was a really great experience because I'd literally just graduated and just moved back to London. Um, and then um, towards the end of that year, a director who I'd met um, when I did the BFI Film Academy, Shola, he had just got some funding to make his um, second feature. So I got, I got that. And so you know, that, that year was quite, actually quite busy for me, but I think it was basically just complete luck and, and having met the right people. Um, but yeah, I feel like I'm definitely still trying to navigate, navigate things to a point where I feel comfortable. I'm definitely not there yet. So out of interest to all three of you, was there a film or a project where you got that kind of career bounce? So obviously Chloe has done For Summer, which was incredibly successful. Dan, you got nominated for a BAFTA for Humans. And then Demiri, you've already cut two feature films. So is there something that boosted your career and therefore suddenly you felt more filmmakers were taking you seriously in your craft and therefore wanted to work with you? Let's start with Endemiri and we'll go back round. Dan always ends up in the middle. He's in a very... <laughs> Actually, let's start with Dan. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the BAFTA nomination was obviously a big boost. Um, that was completely unexpected. Um, and... Um, 
yeah, it's weird because it's not even the project that I kind of am most was my favorite was the you know, thing I really thought this is my editing because mm -hmm. every project is so different and you like like Claire was saying you just don't know what's been going on behind the scenes and what's turned up you know I think that that show was just hit the zeitgeist and people I mean everyone was terrified that it was going to be a flop like that everyone was like no, no one's going to get this and um, no one's going to really like it so it was you know that was great but um I think there wasn't a moment. I mean, even after that, I thought the offers, you know, the offers didn't come flooding in. There's, there wasn't a big moment, I don't think. Uh, it's just gradually sort of crept up. Um, but having a good agent has been really good for me. But that, as I said, that took a, took many years. It's that, it's that catch twenty two. If you can't get an agent, so you've got credits, and you can't get, you know, onto good shows until you've got an agent. Um, but so I luckily, you know, I had an agent initially who. Um, took me on and um, that was really great. She's called Amanda McAllister and she gave me a, a good break by doing that because I wasn't that established. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, I think doing The Crown was definitely sort of, I knew that was a big highlight for me that I got that. I mean, because I couldn't believe when we got it. <laughs> but it's just a director I've worked with over many, many years, um, which is how you get most of your work. It's all, that's why film school's great because you meet loads of young directors. That's one of the reasons. And do you find you still work with NFTS alumni? No, not exactly. Um, I meet them all the time at work, mm. which is nice. Um, but not, not specifically, no. Mm. So how, on Humans, how did you get that gig? Because obviously Lewis Arnold worked on that, so I didn't know whether there was a connection. Yeah, that, no, that was actually one of the few gigs that I've got completely cold without no I didn't know anyone on that show uh, I'm just a big sci-fi fan and I went in and I ranted about how I love reading sort of 60s sci-fi and I think they just thought I would be a good fit um, so that was but there's very 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 few jobs that I get where I don't know anyone on the show it's usually through a director or producer or someone I've worked with before they just want to work with you again so cool uh, let's go to Chloe yeah, I mean, obviously, like for summer, I don't think any of us could really have predicted how um, much attention it has got um, and, you know, all of the various accolades that it's got. And I think we all, you know, you kind of like hope that a film like that is going to get out there into the world and make a difference. And, you know, just in general, not in terms of like your career, mm -hmm. but I the reason why I got that job um, was again because I'd worked with the director before um, and they've been working with another editor who had to um, finish so I came on sort of like five months into the project and then I ended up working on it not solidly but on and off for a year and a half from that point on as it kind of like developed and, and became something quite different um, but yeah that was that was just through through that one person that I'd worked with on a completely unrelated job, um, you know, sort of years before, but we'd, we'd got on really well. Um, I don't know what difference really that's going to kind of like make because I'm still in the immediate aftermath and everything's rather weird right now um, in terms of work and in terms of, you know, what things are being made. Mm. Um, but it definitely feels like a door is at least a jar if not open that wasn't beforehand but it's you know it wasn't like a kind of calculated oh this is the project that I absolutely must work on because it's going to be kind of go somewhere you you just never know where anything's going to go um, and how it's going to end up I guess. And can I ask when you've got that material in front of you and you were shaping it into the film it became did you feel at the time this was something special or could be something special? I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's the most remarkable, harrowing, wonderful, you know, sort of stuff that you could ever imagine mm. having the opportunity to work with. And it's, yeah, the, and it's real. And it, you've got, yeah, I mean, it, it had every kind of element and, and you can see that. And so with that film, it was a matter of trying to find the very best way of telling that story and the very best way of kind of making a condensed version of the experience of watching those rushes and 
talking to, you know, Wad and Hamza and understanding how they got to where they were and, and you know, and how on earth they could have managed to live through that. I mean, it's, it's, it was a real, real, real privilege um, to have possession of those rushes and have them trust me to work with them to, to kind of tell that story. Um, but yeah, it, it did feel special, but still when we were making it, you know, a lot of the comments we were getting from various people was everyone's bored of Syria. There's, there's like fatigue. Um, and so no one's going to kind of, no one wants to hear about Syria anymore. So we, we were like, but this is it's so important, this story, but you, you never know how, how it's going to kind of go down and how people are going to respond. And there's a huge element of luck as well um, in, in how things kind of like take off. They just happen to be shown at the right place to the right audience and people respond and then it, it gains traction and momentum because we didn't have any kind of like proper marketing budget for it. It's not like a big fiction. It's just a relatively pretty, um, you know, low budget documentary feature. Okay. Uh, and Demiri, how about yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I don't, I haven't had like a, a big break or anything yet, but I, I think it's, for me, it's, it's been like trying to find uh, good collaborations with directors and then Hopefully they'll they'll go up the ladder and I I can not I can just like follow along behind them. Um, uh, like for example, with the with the film I made after I graduated, the last tree with Shola, uh, it did a couple of things. It, I mean, one got me an agent, which was really really uh, amazing and um, kind of helped helped give, get, get, give me a leap forward and and get bigger stuff. Um, and then also put me on the radar for the. Uh, of the producer of Blue Story, who then got in contact saying she'd seen the last three and liked it, and would I be interested in working on that? Um, and it's funny actually. I think, like as Chloe said, like you don't, you know, you know, like where films are going to go. And I actually, I think I was a bit snobby at first about when I first got contact with Blue Story because I was like, oh, it's a first time filmmaker. Uh, maybe after doing the last three, I should be looking for someone who's like kind of more established to work with. Like, maybe this isn't the right thing for me. Uh, stupidly, obviously, and then um, and then met, I met the met director Raps, and we got on really well. And I thought, okay, this is I can see how um, this is a really good project to be involved in. And I really like felt like I can uh, contribute to this. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so it's kind of been about trying to find find the right directors. Okay, uh, so we've got some questions. So let's let's open it up to the questions. Uh, let's start with this question, which I think is from Max. Uh, what would you say the NFT has taught you about what is important in editing? Uh, let's start with Chloe. God, no. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, like I say, I've not, I, I haven't really edited before, so I didn't, I guess I didn't have any preconceptions about anything. Um, and that's something that I kind of try and hang on to actually so that every single project that I that I go to I, I don't know how I'm going to cut it I don't have any idea about how it's you know even you know I don't know anything about about the style of the editing in any way um, but which I think helps me kind of like feel like I'm approaching things freshly and like responding to the material as opposed to my knowledge if you know what I mean um, but I mean, I just didn't know anything. So it kind of taught me, I guess, everything. Like I, d I literally didn't know how to use Avid. I've never used Avid in my life. I think I, I'd kind of tried to work out how to use Final Cut and had managed somehow to get through the um, selection workshop with really basic Final Cut knowledge. Um, so I, don't, I don't know everything. <laughs> taught me everything that I know and I don't know what I know. <laughs> okay. Let's go into Mary. I think, I mean, I think there's definitely a couple of things. I think um, one was, I guess, how I work with sound and music. I think I didn't really think that much about it when I started MCS. And um, I think something about the proximity with the sound designers, with the composers, uh, really showed me how much, like both how important it is for that to be like an integral part of my editing process, but also how much I enjoy it and enjoy that collaboration. Um, and spent so many, many, many days in dubbing theatres 
Mm. Sometimes not even for my own films, I just go sit and hang out with them. Because um, it's really, I just really like enjoy that sort of collaborative process, I think. Um, and then as well, I think I it also, I got the um, opportunity to work with a lot of different kind of directors who kind of approach filmmaking in different ways. And that was really useful because I'd have directors who were very kind of strict about what they wanted and they kind of worked out exactly shot by shot how they wanted it edited. Um, and so I kind of had to work out what my contribution was going to be and, and it became sort of very fine tuning about like exactly which frame we cut on. Um, and then I had directors who were totally open, just kind of leave me alone and it'd just be up to me to come up with, with the editing process. And so I got the opportunity to work on all those different kinds of sort of levels of input from directors, I think this has been really helpful. Uh, Dan? Um, I'd echo that. I think working with so many different directors was just invaluable. Basically, I think what's really important, if you want to be an editor, I think one of the most important things is you've just got to cut as much stuff as you can. And going to the, that film school, I had two years and I cut so many films, animation, documentary and fiction, worked with lots of directors. Um, and that was just invaluable. And I think the other thing is, well, I also learned Avid. I didn't know Avid at all, by the way. So and we were, that was really, so Avid Media Composer for everyone who doesn't know out there is, the software that everyone uses in the, well, at least in TV drama um, and most features. Um, and then I think the other thing is, basically I learned to be very critical of what I'm doing um, because a lot of the tutors were very, very <laughs> critical about what I was doing. And it was hard because they would be quite harsh quite a lot of the time. And it really forced me to really think hard about what I'm doing and not, and I don't mean sort of intellectualizing it, but thinking about how you feel about, about your work. So watching it back and feeling what works and what doesn't work and really listening to your sort of emotions and your heart and knowing what's good and isn't good and not, and constantly, you know, working it until it's good. And, you know, um, that kind of level of critique was really, really good, I think and very useful when, when I went out there because I've never had anything that harsh in the real world, so I was prepared, well prepared. I think one thing the NFTS is very good at is that we can all basically cut something together. The NFTS makes you think, why are you cutting? Why are you cutting it there? Why, why is this pacing? Because I don't know, as an editor, when I started off, I was kind of under the impression that I should cut everything within an inch of its life to prove that I've edited it. And in reality, I shouldn't be afraid to just leave that shot alone and just let it be because it's right for the story. Yeah. But, um, okay, let's move on to some other questions. Uh, okay, so let's say... Uh, did any of you come from a working class background and make it to the NFTS? If so, how was it? And how did you find uh, funding? And how did you find, how did you fund things? Uh, let's go and Demiri, I'll go back. Yeah, back. yeah, I definitely did. Um, from a yeah, super low income background. And I think, uh, I mean, I, I guess the advice I was given was to apply and see if you can get in and then worry about money um, because there's a lot of scholarships that are available. Um, I, I managed to get one. I think a lot of students do. And I think that was, uh, I mean, it was essential. I wouldn't have been able to go, not, go otherwise. Um, and so that was really, really helpful. And I think I just about managed, it, I mean, the scholarship didn't cover everything. So I just about managed to find some time during the course to work, to do the freelancing and that sort of paid for the rest of it. And like just about got there, but um, yeah, it, it definitely is possible, and I wouldn't be like discouraged if, if you're from a working class background to apply. Absolutely, Dan. Um, when I went, there was only six a year, and there was quite a lot of scholarships. I think now there is slightly less available, so it's a bit trickier to get. But um, I mean, I probably couldn't afford it to go, but I'm from a middle class background, so I mean. Um, yeah, it was fine. <laughs> I managed to go, but um, I didn't have much money. But yeah, and I'm not going to pretend I'm not from working class background. But um, yeah, Clay. 
guess I'm probably from a middle class background, although I'm not a hundred percent sure. But I um, I certainly didn't have any money to to go. I wouldn't have been able to go if I hadn't got a scholarship. But I I got a scholarship that paid for most of my tuition fees. And I went when I was quite a lot older. I didn't I didn't actually apply to the film school till I was thirty. Um, so I'd been working for quite a long time and I had a tiny bit of savings that was enough to just about enable me to live through the first year with the tuition fees paid by the scholarship and then in um, the second year I had a, I got a loan um, in order to live and then again most of my fees were covered so that's how I managed to do it but I absolutely didn't have you know some sort of pot of money that was there you know ready to help me but that it was it was I think there's a lot of scholarships. I think most of the people on on the course in my year uh, managed to get some sort of help. Yeah, about we have about uh, eighty percent of the students will get some kind of funding support. It may not be a scholarship to cover all your tuition fees, but you will have some kind of financial support if you get to the NFTS. So, I think as Endemiri said, apply because if they want you, they'll find a way of helping you pay for your fees because they want talent. I say they, I am it, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, oh, I'll shut up. Uh, uh, okay, so Joe has asked, uh, what did you find difficult about being at the NFTS? Let's start with Dan. Um, I don't know, it was, it was great fun. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it was hard work, um, and like I say, you're under a lot of pressure, and they really push you hard um, in your work. But I mean, I loved it because I just love editing, and um, it was a great chance to just work on loads and loads of great films. Chloe, I I guess the thing that I found the most difficult was that I think I had the least experience out of everyone in my year. And so I felt like I was constantly playing catch up. Um, and, you know, in a way it's like, that's quite good because you're, you're pushing yourself and you're pushing yourself and you're pushing yourself really hard. But I felt like I had to learn absolutely everything. Um, and it was, yeah, I mean, it was, I put a lot of pressure on myself um, in order to kind of like be up to the same standard as everyone else or where I perceived everyone else was at. Um, I think that's the thing that I found the most difficult. I mean, I also think it is difficult because you're kind of like moving between the disciplines and because certainly when I was there, it was very, the, the schedule was very full on. So I think in the first year, you do do quite a lot of, of sort of exercises just with the other editing students or with the composing or sound designing students. Um, but there did come a point where it's like literally you're, you're, you've just got to the end of one project and you've got another director sort of like knocking on the door with a completely different thing like really like yes here's my rushes let's go into it and you've literally just finished some sort of exhausting um, edit on something else and it was I mean which has also been really good training for you know just having to kind of like reinvigorate yourself and go okay yes this is the next project and we're going to go on but I think I, I think I found that quite difficult also because I was in this position of feeling like I was behind everyone else. And Demiri? Yeah, I think, um, I think similar. I think I felt like I had to prove myself a lot because, but because I was so much younger than everyone else, I felt like I had, I had to like in, uh, make sure everyone knew that I was, I was competent. I was going to be able to keep up. Um, and so, yeah, I put a lot of pressure on myself, especially like in the first year and then, sort of slightly relax more into the, into the second year, but then there was just so much more stuff in the second year to do. And so it just became this like, uh, yeah, definitely this sort of like build up of stamina of trying to like keep going and do, and I, and I did this thing where I kind of picked my grad film based on what would be the hardest to do and what would be the most challenging. So I thought that would, like if nothing else, even if the films don't go anywhere, I'd like learn a lot. Um, and so, yeah, a lot, the second year of MTS like pushed me, I think, more than I've ever gone, ever gone before and ever gone since in terms of like just the amount of hours spent working on, on things back to back. To explain to the audience, we each get our own edit suite of the NFTS, which is yours 
uh, throughout your first year and then you normally swap in your second year to a bigger room you will spend a lot of time in there including sleeping um it is um it becomes very much your home away from home um and you'll often find directors will come in to spend a, an inordinate amount of time in there trying to hide and try and work out what their film is about but anyway uh okay so next question let's take um uh, okay, let's try Joe. Joe asks, how much control do you all have over things like sound design in the edit? I imagine it varies from project to project. Um, okay, well, let's start with engineering with that one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, totally varies. I think um, I've realized, I've done like one television project now and I've realized that there's a lot less, for, or from my experience anyway, there's a lot less control than it was in um the films i've done i think i've had also the film the film schedules have just allowed more time um and i think as i, as I said earlier i really really enjoy the use of sound design and music so i get quite involved and stuck in uh, during the edit um then i also i like to kind of be involved during the mix if possible and and, and, and input quite a lot but i think it it has varied quite quite massively on, on the different projects i've worked on okay chloe um, I don't, I, I think documentary is quite different from fiction and certainly like when you're doing stuff for TV, it's, um, it, I'm kind of doing pretty much everything. Like maybe you have a composer, um, who's working with you and composing things, but they're not composing to pitch and normally, um, you're kind of like maybe sending them like a little clip of something, a uh, section that you're working with and they're kind of giving you a palette of stuff that you can then kind of like weave into it yourself. Um, so I find that I'm doing a lot, um, like the vast majority, and then of course it's mixed. And um, but I haven't worked directly. I've worked with composers, but I haven't worked directly with sound designers on any of the documentary projects I've done. So have you ever been to the mix and seen yeah. them? No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I try and go to the mix mm. always. So that, but, and you know, and actually in documentary, I think the majority of the time when I'm in the mix, what I'm doing is asking them to take out sound effects they put in. Mm. Because it's, it's, you know, I remember once I'd done some, uh, a piece with, uh, it was, uh, there was a scene in Iraq and there was a guy looking over a deserted kind of like desert landscape and there was the sound of birds there when I was in the mix. I was like, why, why are there birds? I can't, there's no birds. And yeah. It's like, can you just strip it out? I'm sure he was like, no, it's there in the actual like sink. I'm like, I don't think it is. It doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah. Dan? Um, I think, well, I've been mainly doing TV drama for the last several years. Um, I mean, I put loads of sound work in to my edits very early on um, and music. There's not a lot of time in TV. Um, and I think, but they expect you to do quite a lot in terms of sound music. And I think the more you put in, probably the more that ends up staying there because you're putting it in for a reason. I mean, the editor, I think if you're going to add sound, you're going to do it because it enhances the story and, well, you hope it, you think it does. But I mean, sometimes what will happen is they'll go away and they'll just redo it slightly, but it will be almost exactly what you had. And sometimes you'll put in some dodgy sound effect you found off YouTube and it will end up being in the final mix. And you'll be like, when you get some TV, you realise. But so um, I do a lot of sound work because um, I think it helps with storytelling. And I don't think there's such a thing as a rough cut anymore, especially not on TV. People don't want to see something that doesn't work. You know, they won't, and they want to see something that works. And sound is part of, of kind of editing. I mean, it's it's... But it's a it's a it's a very important ingredient um, in filmmaking. So yeah, I do it quite a lot. And, and in terms of composing, we often um, don't get composers on board till too late. On the best projects, they get composer on board to actually compose while you're on it. And and like Chloe says, they might send you a palette of stuff and some stuff they've composed, which is brilliant, or previous stuff they've got from other shows. Um, but often you end up trawling through sound. Um, soundtracks from films and just putting on stuff because again if it needs music often it doesn't and often in tv they put too much music on often they'll put on more after i've finished um 
because I think music only needs to be there if it's adding something that isn't there rather than under, underlining something that's already there. Um, so music does change quite a lot usually afterwards, but sound, I'd say, it, it, yeah, I think what you do in the edit has quite a big effect on the final soundscape. Do you guys find that the composer can be slightly miffed if you've um, put a piece of temporary music on, which then the director has fallen in love with? And then oh, yeah, there is a really yeah. delicate thing. Putting, I mean, composers hate it because they just say, "Well, can you compose something that sounds like?" Yeah. And so they're not doing anything yeah. original. Um, but often they just don't have the foresight to get them on earlier. Mm. But on the good good projects, they do, you know. Um, okay, and Demi, if you want to say something, sorry, I thought I cut oh, you off. Oh yeah, actually, I hope one, one starts down about. Um, the mix for, especially for like the Mammoth projects you've done actually, but how involved in the mix? Uh, me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's quite hard on TV to get into the mix. I mean, you can, if you've got time, you can ask to go. Um, I go whenever I can, but usually I'm on to the next thing by the time they go to the mix. Um, but usually, yeah, you can usually go along, but um, you're not really invited. <laughs> yeah. Do you get, do you get, get do you get sent cuts that you can um, give feedback on, like temp mixes? Um, normally, no. once you're done, you're kind of the pictures locked. They kind of often forget about you, um, unless you make a make yourself a, you make a bit of a fuss and, and uh, stay involved. And if you, they have a post production supervisor who will be on top of the scheduling for the editing and the mixes and everything else. And if you're, you know, good friends with them, and they can keep you in the loop, and they can make sure that you get stuff to look at and um, but I mean, if you do go to the mix, you know, I, I tend to, it's the same when you have um, execs in the room and watching a cut, you kind of don't pipe up unless you think um, you really should. <laughs> if you're not sure, don't, because um, then they won't invite you back to the mix again. But sometimes they'll ask what you think and then you can get really stuck in and it's really fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, right, let's bring in another question. Uh, okay, so, We've got a question. Uh, as editors and storytellers in your own right, can you speak about the working relationship with the director from the assembly until the image lock? Uh, let's start with Dan. Um, it depends on the director, but usually I speak to them. So when they're shooting drama, um, I get sent the rushes every day. So the next day I'll get what they shot the day before and I will watch it all the way through every single bit. Um, unless they're shooting some really crazy multicam stuff, but I normally get to watch everything I do. Um, and I will often give them a call and have a chat if they have time and if they want to. Some directors are in the shoot and they don't have time to think about the editing, but once it's in the can, they're like, done, move on, because the schedules are so insane in TV that they are always under pressure just to get what they, the minimum they need for that day. So they often don't have time. But um, some directors I work with regularly, I chat to, most days and I will be back on what I think of performance, how they're shooting it, whether they're getting enough coverage, uh, things I like, things I don't like, and that can be really useful. And I'm actually doing a documentary at the moment and I'm even, I've started earlier than I would normally because I'm working part time, because I'm not, I haven't got any other work because of lockdown in drama. And so I've been talking to them, um, feeding back as I get in interviews and been able to feed back. Um, which they found really useful because normally they wouldn't get the editor on this, I don't know, on this one anyway, until after they finished. And then fine cut. So normally I will then put it all together by myself um, and I will try and keep them out of the cutting room for as long as possible until I get something I'm really happy with. Um, but often they're desperate to get in. And then um, depends on the director. Some like to sit with you every day and others um, just give you notes and then leave you alone, which I kind of, love but I don't mind having them there every day because usually I work people I like being with so it's fine <laughs> but it's nice for me I like having that time to try stuff out and um and then when they watch it they watch it with fresh eyes and they can really respond to it and then you know I think that's quite a good process let's go to Chloe next can you repeat the question sorry <laughs> The question was, um, uh, oh, I've, where have I put the question? 
uh, where the question is. Yeah, when the question oh, that's the one. No, I um, it's, I mean, it varies from project to project. I mean, I think like I actually tend to spend quite a lot of time with my directors sitting in the cutting room with me. Um, I think maybe because documentary, like, you know, it's the structure isn't set from the beginning or there's no kind of like template or maybe there is, you know, I'm sure some people kind of like come in with like a kind of like paper edit. Um, but I, the way that I like to work is to watch everything from the beginning. And I like it if I do that with the director and we can kind of like talk about the rushes as we're going through them. Um, and then um, maybe they'll leave me alone um, for a while and I'll, I'll start putting some scenes together. Um, but I work very closely with most of the directors that, that I've done stuff with. Um, but I mean, like you're staying on the project you're working on at the moment. Um, I, I also like getting involved as early as possible. Um, and to be, and you don't always get this opportunity in documentary, but um, when, when you do, it's great where you're getting stuff in and you're sort of like assembling stuff as they're shooting. And then you can say, you know, like, I don't know, just, just kind of like give some sort of a feedback as to, you know, where you think the story should be going. Um, but it's, I mean, I just, mostly I spend a lot of time with them. Um, you do need to have some time on your own. Like there's like, sometimes I'll find I'll spend all day with the director and then I'll stay super late into the evening, just like kind of like playing around and trying to, to, to do just like a few scenes and, and, and do them in a way that I think is interesting, um, but without the pressure of someone sort of sitting on your shoulder. Um, but then it's, it's just, it's a dialogue. The whole thing's a dialogue. Okay, and Amiri? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I have, um, I've actually had the opportunity to do something I think is like relatively unusual for editors on um, the last two features I did in that, I was involved like right from the beginning from script stage and then also I was on set editing with editing as they were shooting. So um, the last three I was in like the production office, like near the, near the shoot and then on Blue Story was a mixture of that and then literally being on set. Um, and I think, I mean, I definitely doesn't, don't think it works for every project, but on these particular projects, I think both directors for them was like a big jump up uh, in terms of scale of production and everything. and. Uh, but also didn't, they didn't have the luxury of being able to go back and reshoot things um, because it was re relatively low budget. So they needed to be sure that, that, that everything was working um, kind of immediately. And, and I, think they, I think my input uh, in terms of both creatively, whether, whether I thought we were getting everything that we needed and so on and so forth was, was quite valuable. Um, and so I mean, actually we built up quite a close relationship. So by the time you got to post, that just <laughs> didn't come in that much. And they come in, they come in occasionally give notes and then go away again. Um, but by that point we were kind of on the same page and kind of knew, uh, uh, I, I knew what they wanted. Um, and so it was only like towards the end, maybe during the fine cuts days that they then come and sit down with me and we'd kind of work through kind of maybe the more challenging scenes together. Okay. Um, uh, and there's also a, a thing about trust that is quite um, important. If you're working with someone new, it takes some time to build up that trust. And then often they might not want to leave you alone. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like it's their baby that they've put blood, sweat and tears into. And they're terrified that, first of all, it's rubbish uh, and that you'll think it's rubbish or that you'll do something that for some reason is going to harm it by, you know, editing it in a horrible way. <laughs> but then once you work with the director, especially if you're working with a director work before, that's why it's so nice because they trust you and they, they're more likely to leave you alone and just get on with it and um, yeah, get on with the job. Yeah, yeah. I think building up that sense of trust that I've like realised is like so important in terms of like, the amount of flexibility you're going to be going to uh, then be given. I think one thing I learned at the NFTS is by the time the director gets to the edit suite, he or she can be in quite a vulnerable space they have been ingrained in a project for months. Mm. They'll have been on an intense shoot surrounded by loads and loads of people asking them questions. And then suddenly they're alone in a room with just you 
And it's the moment of finding out whether the rushes they've got actually tells the story they hope for. And then it's for us to work with them to try and help them find that story. So they can be quite, um, there's a counselling aspect to being an editor very yeah, much. Yeah, no, I say that all the time, definitely. It's therapy. Yes. Yes, it's, that is something the NFTS teaches you. <laughs> uh, okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, uh, let's try... Let's go with, did you all stay in Beaconsfield during your studies? Or would you say it can be done traveling from home and back every day? I guess it depends where home is. It's going to be the question to this, but um, let's start with Endemiri. Uh, I, I mean, I lived in Beaconsfield, I think, from uh, definitely my year, or well, most of the post-production post -production students lived in Beaconsfield. I think just because of the amount of hours that are required and I also like to be in the editing room quite a lot. So I, I knew I, want, I needed to be somewhere where I, could, I didn't have to commute back. Um, I mean, before that, I was living in London, in South London. So it was quite a long commute, um, it would have been. Um, I mean, I, I think it's possible though. There was definitely an editor in my year who, who commuted, but he had a car, so he was driving in and out every day. Um, so I think, I think it's definitely doable, but uh, for me, it definitely, I needed, I needed that to be close. Uh, Dan? Um, I started off living in London and then I moved to Beaconsfield because I realised that, yeah, you just want to be there as much as possible. It's easier not to have to face an hour and a half getting home. Um, but a lot of people did live in London um, and I spent a lot of time in London. I mean, we used to drive in and spend weekends there. But it's also actually very cheap. I don't know if it is anymore, but it was very cheap to rent in Beaconsfield because there's not much rental market because everyone sort of lives in little mansions and... There's not many students around looking for flats, so it seemed to be quite good value compared to London to live there. And, um, and I'd say it's close enough to London that you can go there a lot, and, um, but just being able to walk back after a late night was really essential, I think, actually, for editing. Okay. I, I lived in London the whole time and I think I knew the train timetable off by heart and I feel like I spent a lot of time commuting but it was definitely I mean it was possible I did it but I mean it was late it was late nights and it was you know sometimes we'd stay over with people in Beaconsfield because you just had to um, but it's definitely possible. Um, about 70% of the student body stays in Beaconsfield and the other 30% is normally in London. But that's only recently switched. It used to be very much more heavily London. I think, yeah, I think in my year, most people were in London. Yeah, I, th I think there's, well, obviously, you know, there are things like we have a bar at the NFTS. So there's a, there's a community and people want to spend time together and you're quite close-knit for two years. Um, but if you do want to live in London, there is reduced rail fares and we do offer, uh, there, is, there is possible. Um, okay, let's move on to some more. Um, uh, Chloe mentioned 24 hours in A&E training scheme. These schemes are pretty much never advertised. Where do you find the information and how would you apply? Um, that training scheme was through the Garden Productions. And I think if you look on their website, there will be um, information about it. I'm actually not sure if they're still doing it, although I believe that they are. I know, I think some, quite a lot of students since my year have kind of done it. I don't know, maybe you know more than me, Duncan. Yeah. Um, but uh, there, but I, I think there's very few such training schemes as far as I'm aware. Um, I think that was the only one. I mean, I kind of, I was just very lucky. I, I did happen to know someone who was one of the editors who was, um, who was doing some of the mentoring and he told me about it and they were literally just trying to get it off the ground um, at the time. But I, I would try the Garden Productions website um, for that. And I think it was, the scheme was at that point called Cut Your Teeth or something like that. Mm. But yeah. I think the showrunner on 24 Hours in A&E is an NFTS or was an NFTS graduate. Was that Abigail? Might be. I'm just going to have a, I shall quickly IMDB that. Uh, does anyone else have any training schemes or any advice they can offer? Uh... Um, I know, I know Skillset do a trainee scheme that is really, really good. And I know a bunch of people have been through there and uh, I work with assistants who've um, 
been through literally that they they assisted me because they were on the trainee scheme um i think that's that's i've heard is really really good yeah, i've worked with um trainees from Skipset and also they've do they do mentoring now as well yes yeah i think i pushed you towards that dan uh <laughs> jackie waldock was the oh jackie yes she is an nfts alumnus so or alumna so yes uh, questions. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, Dan, what are the school looking for in new alumni? Um, do you mean new students? Uh, I'm the alumni manager. I don't get a choice in who becomes an alumni. I just get 300 new ones each year and then try and remember their names. It's pretty intense. And then I annoy the old alumni like uh, Dan by reconnecting with him and just forcing him to give me quotes. Uh, but in terms of new students, I think we are looking for people with passion, basically, and uh, a want to learn. Uh, and it has to be the right time for you, because some people who apply for the NFTS, to be honest, are already there. So you have to be, we are looking for people who are, it's the right stage in their career to do a two-year MA. And... They are passionate and creative and want to learn. Um, I don't think we can add more than that. Uh, let's see some more questions. Um, okay. Uh, I've been researching funding, but due to COVID, a lot of them have been suspended. The BAFTA and Screen Skills applications are now closed, so I missed the boat. Do you have any advice, pointers of where to go to support studying at the NFTS, in particular bad financial positions? So I need to find a miracle. Um, I mean, I'll say that the most important thing is to just apply because, as I say, when, if you are offered a place, then we do have a registry team who will work really hard with you to help you find funding and try and make that a possibility. And obviously, we have internal scholarships and there are organizations we work with. Um, but I don't know if these guys can advise you on whether they got any specific scholarships that they could point you towards? Um, I mean, I got the Toledo scholarship, uh, which is specifically for BAME BA uh, students. So I don't, I don't know if you're applicable for that. I mean, I know it's worth looking in places that might be less usual. I mean, not, not for a huge amount of money, but I know there's a there's production designer from my year who I think got a carpentry firm to give her some money, um, which helped her fund the course. And there's, there's a vegetarian society that will fund, they'll give a little bit of money to any anyone who flies who's vegetarian. And there's like small pots like that that I think are useful not to, be, to, to forget so about. But meat is basically <laughs> a tip. It's also cheaper, so. <laughs> uh, Chloe? I got uh, the David Lean Scholarship through the film school through the registry so i i didn't i mean i'd i'd actually done an ma before at night school um in like kind of history of film and visual media like years before and i'd had um arts and humanities research council funding for that so i wasn't eligible to apply for that again um so yeah i i, I really didn't think there was going to be any way that i was going to get funding and the registry helped me out and managed to get that which was yeah brilliant oh i also got the loan which i forgot to mention earlier i got the pcdl personal career and development loan um which i think was ten thousand i want to say and that, that obviously helped massively uh, yeah, i think i got a loan as well and um i got a scholarship in the second year and um i think it was christy was still doing one yeah um and i think also there's the cinema and television benevolent fund they can help you out as well. Yeah. Worth looking at. Uh, Emmy, who asked the question, said, yes, I am BAME. Um, so it's called the Toledo Scholarship, and it was set up by Duncan Kenworthy, and it's specific to help BAME students at the NFTS. So once you apply, if you were to get in, that is a scholarship that will be open to you, and registry can help you with that. Um, uh, OK, so it's. Uh, Shelley asks, how many non-UK EU editors have you in your course? Uh, do you know how they coped with tuition and living costs? 
um, it's going to be different for every year, I suspect. Um, in my year, I would say it was probably about half were UK and half were international, but I don't know if that's representative of your experiences. It was in mine. There is, um, I think, yeah, I think it was half and half, and I think um, certainly one of, I think the three of them were European citizens, um, the international students, um, and one of them was like from um, Latin America, which I think, I think that does that still make a difference, whether or not you're European or? I think so. I mean, obviously, post Brexit, things have gone a bit uh, skew with, but even more skew with is now COVID. So the government haven't really given as much guidance as to how it's going to work next year. Uh, but yeah, basically for everyone, in theory, EU and UK citizens would pay the same rate um, and then international students paid a different rate. But we don't know how it's going to work for our EU citizens uh, next year yet. But obviously check out the website and we'll keep you updated as we get information on that. But yeah, I think in answer to the question, it's roughly about 50-50. Um, uh, okay. uh, there's quite a few questions. Um, all right, start with what advice would you give to anyone applying for the course? Let's start with Endemiri. Yes, uh, I should have a quick answer to this because I, I, someone asked me a few days ago. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember what I said. I think. Um, Showing, showing that you're passionate, I think is unconsent. I think that's really important. Showing how much you care about, about the, uh, the craft and how much you excited about doing it. And I think, I think also something that I kind of picked up on during my application process is that I feel uh, specifically the editing tutors are looking for people who are collaborative and who are good at work, uh, working with other people and working in different environments. And I think, um, and also who are open to criticism. I think that was like a big thing. Um, like I, I think you were able to understand feedback and, and take that on and interpret it. I think that was something that happened during my, um, I don't know what it's called, selection workshop that uh, I think helped help shift shift whether or not I was going to get in um, was the fact that I was able to, to take on feedback. Um, and I think also just, uh, and I, I don't know because I, I there are people who apply with who haven't had editing experience, um, but I would say if you if you do show that and show as much as possible, um, I can't can't see how that would be a negative. So definitely, uh, Dan. Yeah, all of that. That was a very good answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, just yeah, and just try and cut as much as you can, so you've got a load of stuff you can show them and and prove that you're passionate. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you get how long is the selection workshop now? Is it? It was a week, I think. A week, yeah. So you get a week. So um, if you get through the first stage, you go to a selection workshop for a week. So during that week, you've just got to show that you're enthusiasm and, and yeah, collaborate and open to criticism, all that stuff we've talked about. Um, yeah. Chloe, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think the only thing is to just not be afraid to be yourself and be, you know, sort of truthful to who you are. Um, and yeah, and what your particular kind of influence is. Um, so I don't think, don't, don't try and like give the right answers or expect them to have something, a specific student in mind. I think, I think it's just be yourself. Uh, Guy has asked a question, which is slightly directed to me, he said, and you said some applicants are already there in terms of what stage they're at in their career skill level. How do you ascertain and how would you advise these applications? So basically to explain to people, there's an interview process and then there's a selection workshop process. And the selection workshop lasts a week and you'll cut, I think, fiction and documentary. I don't think I did animation, but I'm not sure if you guys did. And Basically, it's a fun week. Uh, I was taught by Pete Lambert, who's a rather successful alumnus now, and who I still natter to. Um, and I also had absolutely no idea how to even open Avid. Um, so it was a fascinating experience. But yeah, just be open, talk about why you did things. Uh, don't be afraid to kind of 
answer the question. Um, there was a bit where I remember some rushes and a woman was putting clothes into a washing machine and then the camera had cut. And the next image was the woman just looking blankly at the washing machine closed. And I left that in with the cut in and every other student tried to cut around it. And I said, I just left it in because I liked it. And apparently that got me massive brownie points, <laughs> but I don't know why I, I just liked it. So I went with it. Um, so you never know, just be honest with them and tell them why you're doing things. Uh, in terms of whether you're not at the right stage or you're too qualified, I mean, that's for the selection panel to decide. So the editing course is led by Richard Cox. So um, obviously it's going to depend on what they think and the other selection panel people. So there isn't a, a right or wrong answer to that. Um, okay, so I think let's wrap up quickly. We're getting a few more questions before we get in. Um, uh have we answered that question uh what is the thing that you feel benefits you most both in terms of career and life from the experience of studying at the nfts we've kind of answered that going around things but does anyone want to add anything specific to that um I'm, i mean i think yeah i think i've already said this but uh the network and the community of NFTS alumni, I think, has been really um, amazing, and not just like uh, for job offers, but also just for support and being able to ask what other people think about this as like a, a Facebook group with um, the editors from my year, and we're constantly asking each other questions, like technical stuff, but then also like how do you ask, how do you ask for this amount of budget, or like what do you like if you ask for a schedule, like what do you say here, and everyone's doing different things and different. Um, parts of the industry so it's actually really just uh nice to see what everyone else is doing and, and i feel like there's a, there's a support group um which is very nice to be to feel like i'm part of anyone else want to add anything to that or no oh chloe so just just having the opportunity to to try things out just having that time to kind of like just experiment and to kind of like find i don't know just just have find joy in it um and yeah because sometimes there is you know you're working on things like mostly in the industry and you're you are under a lot of pressure to deliver things really quickly so yeah i guess for me it was really really valuable yeah just to be pushed really pushed creatively and also you know like claire was saying the amount of stuff you have the pressure and you know, the expectation. Uh, <laughs> Dan asks, why is everyone speaking with an RP accent if you're all working class? Um, well, I think only Endemiri and I said we were working class. Um, I was born in the northeast of England in a coal mining town, and I show you my Geordie father is also confused why I speak with this accent. <laughs> really sorry, there's not much I can do about it. It's how I speak, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I don't think you can identify someone's class easily just by their accent. There's a lot of, there's a lot more going on behind there. Um, uh, what are your top tips for sound editing? How much do you tend to ADR and Foley versus set location captured sound? Um, it can depend on the project again, really. Uh, yeah, I mean, would, I mean, during the editing stage, I'm the, I, I don't have access to any, I, they haven't recorded any ADR yet, so I'm only using the natural sound on set. And I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, get, I guess when I have an opportunity to be doing the mix, I'm, I'm like as Chloe said, like I'm an advocate for, for keep, keeping in what was there and not, not adding in stuff. Well, I mean, obviously adding in stuff when it, when it benefits the story and when it, um, or when it achieves the intention that we've been trying to do in the edit in a, in a better way. Uh, but I think, I think there's a tendency to like throw in extra stuff that isn't necessary. So I think that trying to, trying to not distract the audience with complicated sound design, I think is, is I've found is really important. Uh, Dan, do you want to add anything? 
Um, there's a lot of ADR um, in TV uh, for various reasons. One of the main reasons is because usually the scripts aren't finished when they start shooting and then you get in the cutting room and find out it doesn't really make sense. And I have written so much ADR in the cutting room that's ended up on the screen that I should have writing credits. But <laughs> and I always say, can you please get the writers to rewrite this? Because this is, this is rubbish. I'm not a writer. I'm just saying like the kind of obvious line that information we need. Um, so often we'll just completely change scenes. They'll say, oh, this scene is about this, but can we just make it about something else entirely so that the rest of the story makes sense? And so you have to think really creatively about how you can be on backs of heads at the right moment to slot in ADR. And it can be really depressing because you don't really want to be on backs of heads. Mm. You know, if it's something important. Um, so it happens a lot. Um, and also they constantly worry about who the people being understood. So um, I worked on an American show and it was, a, it was English and anyone who had a Northern accent, the Americans just said, we don't understand a word they're saying. So they ADR'd everyone at massive expense and it sounded exactly the same to me, but that's the kind of level of ADR that goes on in TV, I think. Chloe? Documentary must be quite different in that realm. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not a lot of, um, yeah, I'm not adding a lot of things in. You're kind of, you're, you're playing with sound, but it's pre-existing sound. Okay, uh, and I'm going to have one last question, which is actually for Chloe. Uh, in regards to documentary, does it almost feel as if you're directing, co-directing the piece, as the story itself is essentially formed in the edit? Does it sometimes feel as if you've got too much control over the film as a result of the sheer amount of footage you're given? Can it feel overwhelming? Uh, I, know, I, I know I'd find it extremely difficult. I, I can, it can feel overwhelming. I mean, it, it depends on the project and it depends on, you know, I mean, I, I really like collaborating really closely and I like, you know, I mean, everything is open for discussion with me, every kind of like decision, but you are, um, you know, certainly in something like for Sama, which is, you know, five years worth of footage that wasn't intended to be a film. You're, you're trying to find the shape of it. You're trying to find a way to kind of like get it across. And that's, I mean, that footage is kind of overwhelming in, a, in and of itself as well. Um, but it's really, I find it really rewarding as well. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think we're collaborators with the directors. Um, and I think the same is, is true, but maybe it's just like a little bit less obvious with fiction. Um, but I think you, you do make changes and you do make decisions, you know, like you're, you're saying Dan about like the, you're, you're writing loads of ADR because the script wasn't finished at the time when you're, um, what, when it was all shot. Um, but yeah, it could, in documentary, it can be a lot, it can be a lot of pressure. Um, and it, it's, yeah, it's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's great at the same time. It's really great. Okay. So the last question is my question to you three, which is maybe a personal one. What do you do when you're lost in your edit? How do you find your way out when you can't see, I don't know, the end in sight, you're lost in the tunnel? Who should I go to first? You're all looking very thoughtful. So I'm going to pick on someone. I'm going to go end a Mary. Uh, I don't know. I feel. I mean, I, I think I really enjoy the collaborative uh, process of collaboration, with, especially like with, like with the director, and to have to have the ability to like bounce ideas back and forth and go, okay, this isn't working. What, what if you did something totally different and throw all the crazy ideas on the table? Um, I think that's, I found that really helpful. I've found taking long walks, long, long cycle rides. I remember doing loads of that NFCS, just going on really, really long cycle rides, just to like refresh my brain. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, I've had like times when I've had like, particular scenes I've really struggled with and eventually just decided to like scrap everything, delete my whole timeline and start from fresh and actually it, um, this helps a lot because I, I suddenly saw new things in the material that I wasn't seeing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's like a fixed answer. 
for that, for that, that those are my methods. Well, I think it's different for every person, isn't it? Yeah, I'm sure. Chloe, how about you? I mean, leave the edits for a bit, you know, I mean, not permanently. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, go for a walk and think about something else. Go and like play a few games of pool and just try and kind of like not worry about it. And I, I think I find a lot of my ideas come to me when I'm not actively thinking about a solution, when I'm just kind of, yeah, doing something else, like blowing off steam, walking, and then some sort of an idea, a new fresh idea um, will come. But also it's, yeah, I, I think it's important not to be afraid to kind of like tear up literally everything you've done and start again and then you'll find that components and elements that you had done previously might come back in but suddenly yeah reframing can kind of make sense of everything yeah dan same for you i think leave the cutting room go for a walk um and i i also i'm not one for doing really late all-nighters i don't think it's often helpful i think um, I work much better when I'm well slept and I like to leave at a decent time and come in early and that's when I do my best work. Um, I think you can go down a rabbit hole if you work really, really late sometimes and then the next morning you look at it and go, what am I doing? And also the, the solution can come to you in an instant if you've had a night's sleep and you've stopped thinking about it. You walk in and you go, oh, what's obvious, I should have just done that last night. So I think just stepping away. Yeah. Although I have had the opposite, where at 2 a.m. you've thought you've nailed it, and then you come back in at 8 a.m. and you're watching it and going, what on earth was I cutting at 2 a.m.? Awful. Anyway, um, thank you all for joining us today. It's been great, and it's been lovely as an editor to speak to fellow editors as well. Um, so thank you, Endemiri, Dan, and Chloe. You're all thank fantastic. You. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, and see you next week for the next Alumni on Zoom. Bye everyone, thank you. Yeah. Bye.